John Goodspin has agreed to stay over for another 10 minutes or so of questions. And, um, and so my job is pretty much done because I understand that Representative Ellison is pretty interested in helping to lead this and move this discussion along. For those that don't know, this is the breakout session on transforming rental assistance. So with that, thank you for joining us. I look forward to the discussion myself. How's it going, everybody? Very good. Come on now, how's it going? <laughs> Maybe the lunch was too heavy and everybody's getting sleepy. Yeah, right, right. But uh, yeah, it's good. You know, this is a session that I've, I've really been looking forward to because the answers to the challenges we have with uh, public housing um, are not are not always readily available. There's no clear like magic bullet, no magic wand, no thing to say. Okay, we just do this, and all our problems are solved. These things are complicated. They are hard. We are going to agree. We are going to disagree. We're going to agree on some things and disagree on others, and that's fine. That's democracy. That's what it's all about. But the reality is. When we, have, when we have such a tremendous need uh, for capital improvements, maintenance in our public housing stock across this, this country, and we have had such a poor history of investing in public housing, it means that we, we've got to do something. The fact is, when we went great guns, when we did the best we've ever done in a long, long time with the Recovery Act, we put about four, four billion down. Uh, and the fact is we still, we still have uh, uh, capital needs in the neighborhood of 30, 30 billion. What that means is that, you know, um, look, uh, public housing residents across America uh, are not living in quality affordable housing. You know, they're living in places that are, that are run down. They're living in places where the unit next to them is so bad that, you know, they just, that the, the management just has to wall it off, and put tape across the front door. They're living in places where there's not enough money to put light fixtures, so people are walking home in the dark, and, and that is a security issue, and no one wants their loved one to have to live through that. We're living in a situation where inadequate alarms, paint peeling, I mean, all kinds of difficult situations. There's stories in the press about elevators that have shut down, not enough money for people to fix them, I mean, agencies to fix them, and, and of course here in the Twin Cities, we're fortunate, because we literally have two of the best public housing authorities in the country. Uh, and that's worth a hand. But, but the reality is, is that we've got to do something, right? Because it's not fair for a, a senior to, to be uncertain about whether or not she's going to make it from her bus stop to her, 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 her housing unit based on She's got to walk through some dark corridor and doesn't know what's going to happen next. It's not fair for some mom to wonder whether, you know, uh, her the, whether the, her daughter is going to be able to get on an elevator and whether it's going to stop suddenly between floors, which has happened. This is not an exaggeration. And, and this is a serious quality of life issue. My vision is for public housing to be housing that any one of us would be proud to live in. Um, and in order to do that, given the, the history of congressional appropriations for it, we're going to have to do something different than we've been doing in the past. Now, I'm open to ideas. The idea that I believe is, is workable and the proposal that I plan to introduce this week is one that I absolutely count on your feedback on, and I've already had a lot of feedback from a lot of people. But the Rental Housing Re Revitalization Act is, is, is a way to solve this problem. And um, I believe that uh, this, this particular bill ha holds a lot of promise, doesn't have all the answers, but it is a way uh, for, for public housing to be able to attract uh, private capital to use that money to invest in and improve public housing. Uh, it's a way to do that, and it's a way that I believe uh, that will uh, accumulate to the benefit of people who live in public housing. Um, the fact is, this bill, you may have heard it before, it had a name called Petra. It's not the same bill, it's been changed. We've made some significant improvements to it. 
uh, and uh, the, it shares many of the same uh, provisions and the framework of the public-private partnership is still there. But some of the important differences uh, include a significant improvement that strike a balance between benefiting the partnerships with the private market and protecting affordable housing value uh, of public housing. And this would include uh, use agreements that would make sure that, that, that no matter in the very rare and, un and, 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 and unlikely incident of foreclosure, that that the the housing would always stay uh, affordable housing and couldn't could never be converted otherwise. Uh, the legislation, uh, the other other things that we've in, uh, integrated into the bill are strengthening tenant provisions to make sure that tenants will always have a say so over their dwelling place and where they live, in their community. We've listened there, and you know, and we're not done listening, by the way. But we are. We do think we're ready to drop the bill, and uh, that doesn't mean the bill is forever etched in stone. Anybody who's ever worked on a legislative process here means that when you introduce the bill, that's sort of a beginning, not an end. But we feel that, you know, we're ready for prime time. But we do feel that there, that doesn't mean we're perfected and doesn't mean there's a lot of important improvements can be done. So I um, uh, want to just result, re, sort of stop there because uh, we, we're going to both be talking more about the bill in the course of this dialogue. I do want to get to the secretary, and I certainly want to get to uh, one of uh, our nation's finest public housing administrators, Mr. Guzman. So uh, let me uh, let me kind of bring my remarks to a close, and then uh, we also want to make sure there's plenty of room for you to weigh in on this conversation. So I'm going to do that, and uh, I've already uh, introduced the secretary. You know him, and he's here uh, with us in the Twin Cities. We're very honored to have you. We're honored by your presence. Uh, everybody give a hand to uh, Secretary. Thank you. And um, I, I obviously said it at lunch, but uh, let me just reiterate that Congressman Ellison is just an incredible leader on these issues. And uh, we, we could talk uh, now for the next hour or so uh, about how to do this best uh, we're going to continue to have that conversation. But the fact is that Congressman Ellison has stood up and said, this ain't right. We can't let public housing continue to deteriorate. We can't lose this precious national resource. And first and foremost, we need to thank him for standing up and saying, something has to be done. The status quo is not acceptable. Um, let me just reiterate uh, a point that the congressman made. When we began talking about transforming rental assistance, we knew that this was an enormously ambitious conversation, that what we were trying to take on um, was something that uh, was not going to be done in a week or a month uh, or even a year, but this was a long-term process and that uh, uh, it was a work in progress. And so we began a series of uh, discussions in Washington, uh, across the country. We've literally met with thousands and thousands of residents of public housing, of those who work in public housing and PHAs, uh, civil rights advocates, uh, private lenders, uh, uh, the full range of those who have been working in affordable housing uh, for decades. And with all the conversations that we've had, with all the views that we've heard, I, I, there are three things that really stand out to me in terms of uh, what comes through despite whatever uh, disagreements there may be. First is the status quo is simply not acceptable, that we cannot continue to lose 10,000 units of public housing a year, and that we have a moment of opportunity now, we have a conversation started that is a national conversation about preserving public housing, this is an enormous opportunity that we cannot waste. Second, that while there's been lots of conversation about the, the details, I think the fundamental principles uh, of less bureaucracy, fewer rules that stand in the way of public housing being successful, uh, more choice by residents, and access to the tools that every other kind of affordable housing in the country has um, are absolutely essential to preserving public housing. We have to figure out how to do that right, 
but those fundamental principles are, are, are there. And third, uh, that public housing authorities have been required to do their jobs with too many barriers and too few resources. And whatever shortcomings there are in our public housing system, the blame rests in Washington, which frankly for too long has forced public housing authorities to operate in isolation from the rest of not only the way affordable housing works uh, with tax credits and, and other things that we've learned over the last half century, but in isolation from communities. It's too hard to get a grocery store into public housing. It is too hard to connect public housing to the surrounding communities. All of that needs to change. And so I'm enormously happy to be here today, uh, enormously excited, excited that the Rental Housing Revitalization Act uh, is on its way, and again, to thank Congressman Ellison. Let me uh, just finally build on a few of the points that he made about what has changed, not to focus on the bill overall, but some of the key differences. He mentioned um, the uh, risk of foreclosure and the concerns that we had heard uh, about that. Just to be clear, even through this economic crisis, loans on tax credit properties have defaulted less than one-tenth of one percent of the time. So the, the likelihood of a property falling into foreclosure under uh, the uh, Rental Housing Revitalization Act is going to be much smaller than the chance of losing that housing now. It's better than status quo, but there were some reasonable concerns that we heard. There's some good points that, that folks raised, and uh, Congressman Ellison has gone uh, the step further to say, we will ensure that in foreclosure, public housing stays public. And so the bill would require either HUD to take over public housing in foreclosure or would uh, allow only public entities, uh, other public entities, to take control of that housing. So there, there is no option for, a ha for public housing in foreclosure under the Rental Housing Revitalization Act to uh, fall into private hands. It must remain publicly owned. So that's absolutely key. But even before a property reaches the point of foreclosure, one of the key things that the bill does is uh, to give, uh, to immediately notify HUD if a property becomes delinquent. And HUD would have the authority to use rental assistance to bring the loan current directly. So we would be able to intervene quickly and early. Uh, and uh, Congressman Ellison has also put in significant protections above and beyond what was there before that would mandate that the properties remain affordable forever. Um, and how does it do that? It does that by saying that the public housing authority must request a renewal of its contract and HUD must renew that contract if the property is in decent condition. That's the only way that a contract wouldn't be renewed would be to protect residents um, if the housing was in terrible condition. And in that case, the bill gives us the authority to take the contract and move it to another property so that uh, affordable housing could continue in a different property that's in decent, safe condition. So those are key, uh, key changes uh, to, to the bill. Uh, second, I, and I want to make this absolutely clear, um, the uh, options under the Rental Housing Revitalization Act are absolutely voluntary. There is no requirement to convert to this system. We understand that this is a big change, and we need to make sure the system works, what we're proposing works, and we would not be requiring anybody uh, to switch over under TRA. And second, um, I want to be very clear that there will be full funding available to those housing authorities that choose not to. This is not uh, something where we're going to be requiring housing authorities. This is a tool for housing authorities to be able to prove, uh, improve public housing. I believe uh, deeply that this bill would provide an option that ha housing authorities will find better and they will choose it, but I want to be very clear that that choice is not my choice as secretary. That choice belongs to housing authorities and residents and local communities uh, about whether to use this option or not. Third, um, the congressman has put in place in the bill, uh, we think a significantly improved resident choice option. And uh, that means that residents of public housing would have the option to move 
but in a way that wouldn't hurt the properties and would not hurt the, uh, those who are on waiting lists uh, for, for vouchers. And uh, before I, I talk about the details here, I, I just want to be very clear that uh, this resident choice option, which I think has been uh, a point of some contention, uh, housing authorities have had some concerns about how it would work. I, I want to be very clear, as I said at lunch, that this is the right thing to do, that giving uh, the ability for our residents to be able to follow opportunity, to move to follow jobs. If there's a family member uh, back home who needs help to be able to move like any of us would, and giving those same choices to public housing residents that all of us have uh, is important. Um, but I also think that we have to recognize, as I said at the beginning, we have a historic opportunity to get uh, preservation of public housing done. Uh, even with the new reality in Congress, I think this is something that can get done. But there are parts of the coalition that support uh, the Rental Housing Revitalization Act that, for them, this choice option is the most important piece of the bill. And that some folks have said to me, well, why are you being so ambitious? Why try and do all these things at once? Why try and do the choice uh, provision as well as uh, the ability to bring in other sources of capital, uh, as well as some of the other things that, that are in the bill. The answer is because we can either hang together in this or we can uh, hang separately. We're not going to get this reform done unless we have the voices of residents, the civil rights community, and many others who believe that this piece, this choice piece, is a critical part of the equation to get it done. We have to have the political coalition to be able to get this done, and choice is a critical piece of making that happen. So that's why I believe it's, it's important. But we also heard some of the concerns. One of the concerns that we heard was, well, if I have a property that has, is not in good condition today, and we give uh, the option to move, it has the potential to destabilize it before we're able to come in do our renovations and keep the property, to get the property in good condition uh, so that it can really uh, compete, if you will, with other housing in, in the community. Well, that seemed like a fair point. And so what uh, Congressman Ellison has done is to include a provision that says if there are renovations being done, only two years after the renovations uh, have started, does the, does the choice option come into place? And so it makes sure that housing authorities have the ability to do the renovations, get the property into a condition, and then uh, begin uh, the, the resident choice option. We thought that that was a good compromise uh, to be able to make sure that the, the properties are in good condition uh, before that begins. Uh, we also have added provisions that allows, uh, uh, working together with Congress Ellen, to, to allow housing authorities to work with HUD to adjust their waiting lists for public housing and vouchers to make sure that no one is hurt by uh, somebody taking a, a voucher out of public housing to be able to move. We heard concerns that is it fair to those who are on the voucher waiting list to allow people to move ahead. This would provide flexibility uh, to adjust the waiting list to make sure uh, folks don't get hurt. Finally, and, and Congressman Ellison did uh, say this, I want to reiterate it. Um, Strengthening uh, the resident rights provisions of the bill was critical uh, to protect residents uh, from uh, eviction or rescreening uh, in uh, any conversion. So uh, if somebody moves out for renovations or anything out, they would have the ability to move back uh, to, to, to the uh, development that they left. Uh, and it, it also is critical uh, for uh, extending these rights for the first time ever to voucher holders. Today, uh, those who use vouchers don't have these same rights, and this bill, Congressman Ellison's bill, for the first time would extend those rights to voucher holders. So absolutely critical. Um, all of those are key changes to the bill. Uh, there's lots more that, uh, that we could talk about in terms of what the bill does. I'm sure we'll get to that. I want to make sure uh, that uh, Mr. Gutzman has, has a chance to uh, talk to you as well before we get into a conversation about it. But, but let me just end by saying this is a historic opportunity. Uh, this is an opportunity where we are finally having a national conversation about preserving public housing. We need to make sure we get the best bill we possibly can, and then we have to do everything that we can 
to make sure it gets passed. That, this is a historic opportunity. Let's not let it uh, go to waste. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, the Twin Cities uh, Public Housing Authorities in Minneapolis and St. Paul are lauded all over the country. In large measure, that's because of the man sitting at the end of this table. Uh, John has uh, trained, he has mentored, he has worked with many of the most prominent leaders in our public housing system, including my, my good friend Cora McCorvey, who does a great job in Minneapolis. And she is right over there. Stand up, stand up, stand up. Uh, and, and the fact is, is that uh, he, uh, he and I met, and I of course met with Cora as well, and we had, we had some tough conversation and we are going to have an ongoing conversation. And uh, we absolutely need your ability to spot um, uh, uh, improvements or where, you know what I mean? And, and so I, I do welcome you, and I want to let you know that it's an honor and a, uh, and a privilege to be seated with you today. So let's hear it for John Goosman, everybody. And, and Cora McCorvey, who's here as well. Yeah. Thank you. I'm just going to speak up here because I know uh, Secretary Donovan was really wanting to steal all my remarks, so I, uh, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll help him uh, avoid that. I was thinking about this uh, conversation between former Soviet Union Premier Gorbachev and President Reagan. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev apparently said, Mr. President, all this talk about free speech in America, uh, what's the big deal? We have free speech in Soviet Union too. And Mr. Reagan apparently said, well, the difference, Mr. Gorbachev, is that in America you're still free after you speak. <laughs> you see, I'm a little intimidated by the, uh, the, the panel in which I find myself today. Um, <laughs> I'm glad I'm speaking in America. <laughs> so a few other points of view. Uh, first of all, I do want to thank Secretary Donovan for being here today and uh, for caring about preserving public housing and obviously having this dialogue. And I'm going to return there and have the give and take in a minute. Uh, I want to thank him for everything he did regarding the Recovery Act funding. It was huge. It made a big difference. And I want to thank him for his continued dialogue he's had with the industry groups on uh, Petra, and if, if you don't mind, I'm just for shorthand going to call the new one Petra 2. I know that's not its no. name, but my speech was written that way, so. <laughs> um, and I appreciate uh, the reception that uh, a letter I wrote in August received, and in that letter I want to emphasize I said that I support a voluntary conversion program of the portion of the portfolio. I really want to thank Mr. Ellison for the call. I have been in this business 30 years. I've never had a call from a congressman, and it was Mr. Ellison who called me and invited us over to have a chat with him. I'll never forget that, and I really appreciate that. And clearly, he gets it. Uh, Cora has a luxury of, of working with him. Our congresswoman, McCollum, gets it. Uh, we have the privilege of working with her, too. But Mr. Ellison, you are the right person uh, to lead this critical discussion. And I like what you said this morning about your stout, open-hearted advocacy. That was, those are good words. My, my outlook on Petra too, forgive me, is uh, largely embraced by uh, comments of other folks I admire. Sheila Crowley, the president of the National Low Income Housing Coalition, and Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who sits on the same subcommittee as Mr. Ellison. Chairs it, Ms. L Ms. Uh, Crowley. That this bill is still a work in progress, and Maxine Waters. That for eight years she fought the attempts of the Bush administration to actually kill the program, and she's a little bit afraid that this whole concept of leveraging and mortgaging is based on the premise that we've given up on trying to adequately fund the public housing capital fund. Those are her words. I've not given up. Um, I'm proud of my record over the last 30 years to help preserve the 1.2 million units of our nation's housing we call public housing. That does include fighting the right 
uh, in their efforts to eliminate the program, and I have to say fighting the left at times to over-regulate the program. I'm proud to be a small part of owning and managing this portfolio. It is safety net housing. It comprises 1% of the housing supply in America. The 2000 census had there being 116 million units of housing in America, public housing less than 1% of that. And mostly I'm proud of the record of the St. Paul Public Housing Agency, where I've worked for the last 23 years in providing quality, safe, and affordable housing to 20,000 people. So it was a in that spirit that I offered the letter. Uh, today I only have time to talk about four or five points. However, I do have a handout that I'm going to leave the Secretary and Mr. Ellison. That's a collection of concerns from about 200 other folks. Um, and I'll leave that with you. Um, I also feel that it's good we're beginning this conversation. And I know Mr. Ellison and Mr. Donovan don't believe we're going to end it in the lame duck session. Uh, in my view, portions of this bill will be ready for adoption in three to five years. Uh, industry principles, uh, num my point number one, the industry has written a, a document which is also attached to my comments and all of my comments uh, will be available on our website. Uh, and they've articulated a few concerns. First of all, that a conversion initiative must have as its overriding priority, the preservation of public housing. Um, there are about 200 or so unanswered questions. Three of them, some of them the Secretary touched on that I would highlight, rent setting. I think properties in low cost areas under this plan will simply not have enough market rent to leverage the funding that they need to accomplish their modernization work. Secondly, I do think the mobility issues are huge. I think that conversation is just beginning. Uh, will it make the public housing property simply a portal to Section 8? And yes, there is this issue of fairness for folks already on the waiting list. There's regionalization of Section 8 in this bill. Some of us worry that you can get too big and become inefficient. Uh, we worry about a super bureaucracy that could harm applicants and remove accountability. Um, also, Point number two, I really like hearing what the Secretary said about no net loss of capital fund. Um, those are newer comments from HUD, and we really appreciate those. I heard you articulate that at the uh, October CLAFA meeting in answers to questions from Baltimore and Yonkers, and it's very important to me. And Mr. Ellison, when we chatted, you said it was one of our, our strongest criticisms. Uh, there will be a remnant public housing portfolio, and that's the point. Even with conversion, even with it being wildly successful, and by the way, I think it will be successful, and I think many housing authorities will gravitate towards this. But there will be a remnant public housing portfolio, and I'm going to guess of at least 750,000 units that exist in perpetuity, assuming conversion is truly voluntary. So I'd like to work with Mr. Ellison to craft an amendment to your bill that helps ensure that there is proportionate capital funding uh, for the non-converted conventional public housing program. I would also point out, Mr. Secretary, it, it really was this public housing model that did the $4 billion, not some new hybrid that's on the Petra II drawing board. So I think uh, we have to understand that there will be a large remnant of the existing model in place. Uh, point three, I think Petra II's protections against privatization are truly better than round one. But there's another concern I have on that that's maybe an unintended, potential unintended consequence of simply adding debt to the public housing portfolio. And that is we already know the promised land that we would migrate to, the multifamily portfolio, also loses units every year because of simply having too much debt on property. Maybe it's poor underwriting, but nevertheless, uh, there are properties in the multifamily world that go under every year. Some have over $250,000 worth of debt today. It's really no accident that Dan Bartholomew and the Minnesota Housing Finance Agency had to create a program that is called Preservation Plus that will identify which multifamily projects in Minnesota can be retained and which have to be lost. They're putting scarce capital dollars in to preserve what? The multifamily stock. 
So that's the world HUD would like us to migrate to. And I'm simply saying there could be unintended consequences of simply adding debt, simply finding out 15, 20 years from now, public properties were laden with too much debt and they face these difficult choices. Um, this next point is just the public houser in me. Cora would understand that. Um, why am I pressing for increased advocacy of the conventional public housing portfolio alongside of a converted portfolio? Well, because for, for most housing authorities in the country, even with the perils of the annual appropriation cycle, and I would say even with this new Congress, that model still works. And that model can get the job done. We've tested in previous administrations where the floor is on appropriations. So the model can get done without a new funding mechanism, in my opinion, for the entire portfolio. Um, these housing authorities that do this job every day embody another president, former president's words that I like, Bill Clinton's working hard and playing by the rules. And some examples of my housing authority, uh, we've been high performer designation by HUD for 20 consecutive years, 99% occupied for 15 consecutive years. We reduced turnaround time uh, 13 days from key to key, time of units turned in to re-rent it on 800 vacant units that come up a year, zero financial audit findings for 12 consecutive years and on and on. And it's our staff and it's a dedicated board and leadership that help us do that. But the point being, we're not alone. There's 32 other, 3,200 housing authorities in the country, most of whom do that same thing. Next year, the significant thing that I'd like to put on the table is we're going to complete a $34 million renovation of our largest family development, McDonough Homes, uh, without having to borrow without having to leverage assets. We're using our capital fund, been planning it, using it wisely for the last nine years. We'll do a Hope 6 type scale renovation, again with no net loss of inventory, no relocations. That's preservation of the public housing assets. So, Mr. Secretary, we're not alone. PHAs across the nation get the job done with the existing funding mechanism, even given the perils of Congress. Uh, New York Housing Authority, which you know well, has not lost any of its 160,000 units. In fact, they just added 20,000 more. Now there's, of course, some story to that, as, as you know very well. But many PHAs, elderly properties, Hope 6 properties, MTW properties, actually probably can't benefit by Petra too. So I'm hoping we hear more from the Secretary in the years ahead, the months ahead, to keep that portion of the portfolio as is, to be its champion. It's far from broken. It needs to remain in place. My last two points, very quickly, are a couple reality points on, on some of the stated goals of Petra. Uh, number one, the department correctly cites the loss of 150,000 units of public housing over the last 15 years as a key rationale. Part of this just, I get the numbers, but part of it I wonder about because HUD has approved the loss of each and every one of those units over the last 15 years. Um, 25,000 units have been lost in the last 20 months alone. And the reason I bring this up is I understand there's a pipeline in process for unit disposition. And I do understand that many of the dispositions involve one for one replacement. But if Petra II became law tomorrow, I wonder if the department is really confident these losses will end. I haven't seen a specific nexus in the legislation between conversion and loss prevention. Uh, and you think about the capital fund, the four billion was great, and you add the 2.5 billion that we already got from the capital fund. So that's 6.5 billion was spent in the last year, and we still lost 10 or 15,000 units last year. So I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying something isn't meshing with the headline there. Also, the headline of uh, merging the 12 or 13 separate rental assistance programs that would be streamlined or simplified under Petra. I know a lot of that's in the bill, I've seen it, but it's also probably uh, somewhat of what's the expectation, what's the definition of transformation, because 
Each one of those 13 programs was created by an act of Congress. The Section 811 program, for instance, is allowed by statute to house disabled only. The Section 202 program is allowed by statute to provide housing for elderly only. Public housing is prevented from discriminating in our admission in the same manner. So I haven't really seen that HUD is intent on changing all the criteria, all the programs, all the program elements of these disparate 12 or 13 programs. I have seen some increased tenant protections and perhaps some of the financing obligations, opportunities. But part of that is also a, a disconnect for me. And the public houser says, and you have to forgive me and us when we say things like this, but Petra II simply seems to saddle the public housing program with more regulations uh, when the other 11 or 12 are essentially allowed to operate as is. We've been told by other HUD officials that's just a political reality. You have to accept that the multifamily world will never accept all the public housing regulations such as tenant protections, lease and grievance procedures, residents on boards, community service, section three, and so forth that would come their way if the programs were truly merged. So one has to ask, is that fair? One has to ask what entitles that portion of the affordable housing portfolio to maintain firewalls protecting it from the so-called burdens of public housing regulatory world. And if the public housing regulations aren't inherently in the best interest of low-income residents and frankly society as a whole, then why do they exist in public housing? A minor point about level playing field, some PHAs like mine, even if we could and wanted to access this program, would be at a competitive disadvantage. There's 3,200 PHAs and PHAs in the country. There's probably 3,200 different state enabling or city, county, or uh, charters that have enabled each one of these. St. Paul PHA is restricted by state law to owning and managing public housing. So we cannot create a nonprofit affiliate, which means we can access tax credits, which is the best private financing tool out there, which means our costs of borrowing would be higher, which means we'd be adding risk. Um, last point, there's other great bills in the Congress. Uh, Mr. Frank's HR 5814 uh, I think is fantastic. Uh, it's called a preservation bill. Uh, it has many elements that are frankly a bit more appealing to PHAs than Petra II, including capital fund loan guarantees, utility cost savings, allowing the use of the capital fund to create new public housing units, grants to cover converting public housing to assisted living, and so forth. I would also hope, Mr. Ellison, uh, you would look at adding and working with your colleagues to affirm support for those provisions. Last point, uh, Mr. Ellison, I would hope you would consider uh, making Petra II not only as it voluntary, but consider it as a demonstration program with rigorous evaluation. Uh, those of you who know about the Moving to Work program, it affects some 30 housing authorities in the country, and all kinds of advocates want to put more evaluation, more rigor around it. I would submit to you that a program that could conceivably transform 3,200 housing authorities and 1.2 million units perhaps ought to have an evaluation component around it. So I'm done. I have uh, 200 other questions and comments that I'm going to give the Secretary and Mr. Ellison when I return. They're all written out. Thank you for your time. Received. <laughs> so, so now I think it's a good time to um, to just uh, have some some open conversation. Uh, I'm going to stand up uh, since I'm kind of short anyway. Uh, now it's a good time to have some some open dialogue. Uh, I think uh, we you've heard sort of the various sides of this this dialogue, and it's time to hear from you. A few ground rules, if you would. I believe, and I hope you agree, that you could probably make your point within, I'd say, 30 seconds. Okay? And, and um, 
and uh, so please do make that point within 30 seconds. Do I have your approval? Be bearing in mind that once you go on like a, a real filibuster, that you're all, you're just you're just stopping others of your colleagues in this audience from getting their point of view out. Uh, and then um, and then let's you know and, and then you don't have to ask a question. You certainly can, uh, but um, but I don't think we have a roving mic. So oh, we do have a roving mic. Oh no, we're not ready for that. I don't think we have a roving mic, so I'm going to ask everybody to to speak speak out as strong as you can. Use your uh, outside voice, and um, again, I am uh, I'm going to be picking hands as 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 fairly as I can. If I don't get to you, I'm not picking on you. It's just that it's hard to see everything everywhere. So uh, with that, uh, I'm going to sort of start here and go this way and try to get as many, as many uh, points of view in. And uh, last point is that you may or may not uh, get a, a response directly after your point, but I guarantee you that if you want to write down your question because you do need some sort of a response or would like that, we'll take those. Uh, and as a matter of fact, where's Allison? Do you have those cards we were talking about, Allison? And Chip has them right there. Now stand up, Chip. So Chip has these cards. And uh, we can do uh, from the floor points, or and, and we'll also do cards too. And uh, but we but if anybody who fills out a card, we will take that card and receive that card, and and, and use it to try to make a, a, a better product. So with that, let's start uh, over here. Who wants to have a, a say? So I think that gentleman way in the back had something he wanted to say. Okay, the question is, does, uh, does the secretary want to um, offer any sort of uh, a response or rebuttal to the points that John Gutzman made in his presentation? Um, thank you, and I do want to make sure we get to questions. So let, let me just quickly, I think there's a, there's a number of things that John said which uh, this, the bill, Congressman Ellison's bill, the Rental Housing and uh, Revitalization Act, not Petra Joe, um, is uh, really gets to that are key. One is on rent setting. We absolutely recognize that there are properties that are located in areas where a market rent is not going to be sufficient. And so there are exception rents that would be available to those properties to make sure they have adequate uh, funding to operate. Uh, there's nothing in this bill whatsoever that uh, forces regionalization on housing authorities. We have uh, a number of housing authorities that have come to us that want to regionalize or want to join forces on particular pieces. The, the bill and, and the funding that we're asking for would uh, allow that to be easier, to encourage it, but nothing at all would require it completely voluntary, and I just want to be uh, clear about that. Um, John also mentioned that there have been issues with multifamily properties. Um, having run the multifamily uh, uh, part of HUD in the last time I was at HUD. What I will say is there are, we lose properties on the multifamily side. We don't lose them because of uh, too much debt. We lose them because of not enough income and being mismanaged. And so this would not take away the issue uh, of there being mismanagement. There are going to be, not every housing authority is St. Paul, right? We do have housing authorities just like we have private owners that aren't doing their jobs, and there are going to be times where HUD has to step in and enforce and take those properties. What's key about the bill is it says, one, we will absolutely preserve the affordable housing there, and two, that in any, in any foreclosure, it has to be maintained as public housing. So we should be enforcing where, where owners, whatever their kind, uh, public, private, whatever, aren't doing their jobs and make sure that the property is brought up uh, to decent, safe condition. When you look at the multifamily stock, they don't have $30 billion of, of capital needs. And that's where I would really end, um, is I, I think the biggest difference with where I sit and where, what John is saying is the sense of urgency that I, I feel. John has done a great job here. 
But even in New York, which he talked about, there are 100,000 work orders sitting on the desk of John Rhea, who runs the Housing Authority. And I don't think anybody can argue that we have adequate capital. And I, don't, I think it's just very hard to argue, particularly in this new reality, that we're going to be able to find $30 billion uh, of capital anytime soon. And this is an opportunity to, to bring that capital to public housing that it desperately needs. And I'm, I'm not willing to wait three or five years. I, I want to get this done now. Okay, let's keep going. Yes, sir. Remember, you got 30 seconds, which starts now. Good, good job. Uh, so uh, the Hearth Act, for those of you who don't speak HUD, is um, a bill that was passed last summer that fundamentally remakes our homeless assistance programs at HUD. And the basic answer is that there really isn't an overlap between the programs. The, the Rental Housing Revitalization Act is, is focused on public housing and a few of the multifamily programs. This goes to John's point about the 13 different programs. There are a set of programs, an alphabet soup of rents up and wrap and a whole set of what I would call orphan programs that literally, when they run to get to the end of their contracts, there's nothing we can do to preserve them. There are literally no options. And this bill would give us options to fold those into the project-based Section 8 program. And hence, that goes to, we're not saying all 13 programs are going to be folded into one. What we're saying is it gives us an ability to start to bring some of those orphan programs into the fold and to uh, end up probably with 10 programs or nine programs rather than, than the 13 in this first phase of the act. Looking for hands? Okay, uh, right here. Now, Mr. St. Paul Public Housing, I work with John so people on the Section 8 waiting list would be disadvantaged by public housing residents having the right to take a tenant-based voucher. But how does that actually work without greatly expanding the number of vouchers? I, I like the idea that if we have 4,000 on our waiting list for Section 8 and about 4,000 <coughs> housing units, if 500 tenants from public housing okay. have to take a tenant-based voucher. Got to wrap it up. Like this. So, <laughs> so um, the, I think the question was, um, how is the mobility set? Can you, can you yeah. 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 Um, he asked some specific questions about how the mobility feature is going to work, which, um, you know, how do you actually balance the needs of residents on the public housing waiting list versus the voucher uh, program? Let me say three quick things about this. First of all, this is not a new thing. The project-based voucher already gives uh, residents an ability to get a, a voucher and move. And it actually gives it to them within a year rather than the two years that would be here. So it's, it's actually a more flexible uh, option than the one that we're proposing. And it exists. It, there have been issues with it that, we, that I think are tried to, we tried to solve with uh, Congressman Ellison's bill. But the fact is it already exists, and housing authorities know how to work with that in general. So I don't think it's a, it's a, a brand new thing. Um, second of all, um, whenever somebody moves out of a public housing unit, there is also access to that public housing unit, right? So we're not losing any housing. And this, the bill would give the flexibility to, able, to be able to move people back and forth between uh, the waiting lists to be able to adjust for that. So that's one of the uh, types of flexibility. The last thing I would just say is I, I think we can all agree we want more vouchers. And so one of the things uh, that the, uh, the bill would allow us to do is to get started on a relatively small number of public housing units as we started these conversions and really see what the turnover is, what percent is it a year, and to be able to estimate, is that something that's handled pretty easily through turnover, or is it something where we really are going to need to expand the number of vouchers that would be available? And I'm very open 
to saying we're going to need some extra vouchers to be able to do that. We've even thought of ways, there are pots of, of funding within Section 8 that might be used for that, either tenor protection or other things. And so I think there are ways to, to actually get some new vouchers and new voucher funding on the table to make sure that in the end it's fair to, to everybody that's on a waiting list. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. The question. Um, I'm sorry to feel like I'm you don't have to let John speak up here, but um, the the answer is yes. And in fact, um, Barney Frank, I think one of the, the uh, very productive things, uh, one of the many productive things he's done with his proposals is to start to look at ways that you could expand the availability of credits uh, to be able to provide funding for uh, converted public housing or preserved public housing. And what I would say about that, I personally am concerned about creating a set aside just for public housing because what's made the tax credit program successful over the years is that lots of people fight for it. It's actually one of the things why, one of the reasons why I think the Rental Housing Revitalization Act would be powerful is that the more people we have fighting for funding for public housing in Section 8, if we bring those programs together, the more likely we are to be able to get funding. There's never been a Section 8 unit that was unfunded. And you don't, you see much more pressure on public housing uh, appropriations than you do on Section 8 or other forms or tax credits because there's a bigger coalition fighting for it. I think that's one of the, so I don't think we want to break that up by you know, taking a piece of tax credits and saying only public housing authorities can use them. I think what we want to do is expand options for uh, preservation of federal housing or something like that to give uh, maybe a basis boost or there are other ways to accomplish it that could be interesting and we're working on proposals like that. Very good question. Ma'am? I'm Deanna with the Jackson Housing Authority and the um, revitalization um, act has been referred to as phase one a number of times. Do you have an overall plan for uh, I think the answer is we got to see how phase one works. I mean, this is, as I, as I said before, this is absolutely uh, a, you know, major undertaking. We need more input on it. I think Congressman Ellison was very eloquent about the need for a continuing conversation. And really, we have to see how it works and, and make decisions about what it looks like going forward. You, you know, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll address that. You know, this bill, I don't have any phase one or phase two or phase three. There, there is no hidden agenda. This is a this is a honest attempt to uh, provide for and maintain public housing, and uh, we're having a lively conversation here about how to do that. But there is no, there's no ex, there's no. I have no other phases at all. So, uh, uh, sir, yep. The, the Recovery Act. The re <coughs> Sorry. Well, would that be for, uh, I hope this doesn't come all off my 30 seconds. <laughs> 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 oh, as that, uh, to revitalize or uh, uh, put these uh, units that are in disarray back in array? No, I think that would take about 30 billion, and I think that uh, in with the Recovery Act, we put out in about 4 billion. built our first affordable housing project in 1971 and it's still in operation and we've not had to have any bailout to uh, the wood frame building. We've been able to keep it up uh, with the amount of income. Why is it that public housing needs a big bailout here to get the units up to speed? Is it management uh, or what? I mean... Yeah, good question. What, what has caused the deterioration of public housing. And again, let me be clear, Minneapolis and St. Paul have have done a very good job. And, and, you got 34 million to do your own job. You know, but either one of you, I'll take it. We got, uh, we got uh, 
34 million over eight years, so we took a portion of it each year and, and worked on a 580 unit development, spending about $65,000 per unit, keeping it 99% occupied when we rehabbed it. So it was a big deal. Uh, nationally, I, I think Mr. Donovan is, is more steeped in the issues. Public housing was created in the 30s. I read in the Shelter Force article that was recently out, um, the private industry fought the creation and establishment of public housing every stretch of the way, and that led to compromises in building, building locations, building materials. So public housing, it is said, had uh, one hand tied behind it back when it was created because it was compromised sort of over the dead bodies of the, the National Realtors Association of the time. And that led to unfortunate places uh, that have now been torn down with Hope Six renovations, the Cabrini Greens, and, and lots of the public housing that really did need to come down and has been replaced with uh, mixed income, townhome, lower scale development. So there is part of the inventory that was severely distressed and is part of that backlog. But a lot of those properties have come down uh, and a lot of the public housing in America is, is uh, sound. I believe HUD's scores show that about 80% of the housing authority is standard or high performing. So there are outliers in any industry, uh, but most of the public housing is in pretty good shape. It's just uh, accumulated backlog. I guess my perspective would be we simply don't provide public housing enough money to manage itself. And I assume you have a project-based Section 8 property. Started out at 236. 236, now project-based Section 8. Look, and this is a bit of my point before, there is a big tent for most housing, housing programs in this country. For tax credits, for project-based Section 8, you have a broad coalition of supporters that will stand up and say, fund this program. For too long, PHAs and residents of public housing have basically been alone in fighting because the only source of money, uh, except if you're going to be creative and willing to bang your head against the wall the way John has been to bring in other sources of funding, the only money that keeps it up is federal funding. And that doesn't create a big tent. And so one of the fundamental points I think we've made from the beginning is let's bring public housing into the tent. Let's allow it to do what every other kind of affordable housing in the world, uh, or maybe at least just the US at this point, can do, which is access other kinds of, of capital. And by doing that, you not only make sure it's, it's no longer underfunded, but I think you build a broader coalition, political coalition, for, uh, for public housing. You know, we, we only got about uh, 10 more minutes, and I was given strict orders that the secretary had to, had to go in at the appointed time. So um, you guys are doing great on the 30 seconds. We may, I mean, we may need to shorten. Okay. <laughs> we may need to shorten some of our answers. But look, let's let's have those cards because we will work. We want to be engaged, and so those cards are going to be real. We have this uh, young lady who's getting these cards around. So let me stop talking. Any, let me find some hands in here, Chip. So um, in 30 seconds, um, this would, and I was going to look for the number, um, I think we've, we've looked at what it would provide in additional funding just for Minneapolis uh, and for the Twin Cities, and if I can get that, I'll, I'll come back to it. Um, but overall, and, and let's be clear about this, and I think the Congressman has been as well, this would provide more money for public housing. If you take the, the capital fund and the operating fund and you put them together, this would be about a billion dollars more a year across the country. So it is more funding uh, each and every year to public housing. Um, and that means that just about every housing authority 
would benefit significantly from more funding, and certainly no housing authority would get any less uh, under the market rents because we have the exception rents. Let's use those cards so we can get deeper into the questions we have. Uh, in the back, ma'am, 30 seconds. Thank you. Thank you.